गुड इवनिंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड नमस्ते कोविड नाइन्टीन पैंडेमिक कंटिन्यूस टू टेक इट्स टॉल अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड फर्स्टिंग लाइफ एंड ब्रिंगिंग अपेंस टू सोसाइटीज एंड इकोनॉमीज अराउंड द ग्लोब many hospital services were closed entirely either due to capacity issues or safety concerns while intense social distancing measures made routine trips to hospitals and pharmacies an extraordinary task moreover people with chronic health conditions as hypertension cardiovascular disease and diabetes are also those with greater risk of falling critically ill or facing fatal consequences if infected for this reason many patients and their families even hesitated to visit the hospital the health authorities recognized this problem and issued a series of policies to promote telemedicine as part of the ongoing internet plus healthcare strategy online consultation services were boosted either by revamping existing privately owned online telemedicine platforms or equip public hospitals for such functions today we are having third webinar of second phase of onka webinar series today's topic for this webinar is digital health in the pandemic a way looking forward this webinar is organized by onka onka working party on e health and special interest group on emerging practice models in family medicine at first i would like to introduce all moderators for this webinar including me i Dr Pramin Prasad Gupta associate professor department of general practice and emergency medicine bp coral institute of health science nepal and chair of onka working party on e health along with harris ligidagis designated ceo onka and dr rakel gomez bravo she is a phd student institute of health and behavioral science university of luxembourg i would like to introduce our speakers and panelists for today's webinar our speakers are professor ilka kunamo editor in chief ebm guidelines and development director udc medical publications adjunct professor of general practice in university of helsinki finland our second speaker is professor dr nick gulleman he is senior researcher at leiden university and medical center national health living lab netherland our third speaker is dr liliana larenzo research fellow faculty of medicine and health westmead applied research center westmead hospital university of sydney Our fourth speaker is Professor Richard H. Osborne. Richard Osborne, an epidemiologist, researcher, holds a prestigious Australian NHMRC Principal Research Fellowship focusing on global implementation of evidence-based contemporary health literacy, informed intervention to reduce inequalities, and assist countries to reach the SDGs. He holds honorary appointment at Copenhagen University and Thammasat University, Thailand. our next speaker is dr raman kumar and he is president of onka south east asia and mehmet ungan he is president of onka europe we will be having panel discussion on predicting digital health after the pandemic and our panelists are Professor Richard Roberts, past president of the World, Dr. Anna Luisa Nevis, she is a research fellow in clinical analytics and patient safety, Institute of Global Health Innovation, Imperial College, UK. Now we are going to start our webinar, and at first I will request Harris to play welcome remarks video of Professor Donald Lee, president of Wanka. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you for taking time during your busy schedule to attend the second series of Wonka webinars. Family doctors around the world have risen to the challenge of this awful pandemic. In the midst of the massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. It is heartening indeed. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is bringing a lot of changes to our professional and personal lives. We are slowly adapting to the use of technology to overcome barriers and challenges created by the pandemic. We are getting used to meet virtually and using the cyberspace like what we're doing now. Colleagues are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. They're keeping in touch with each other regularly, like family members, relaying information, urging courage in these extraordinary times. 
I think all those who participated or listened in our various webinars held in June and July will agree they have been well received and appreciated by many family doctors around the world. I'm really looking forward to the next series of webinars, which will include presentations from our working party and special interest groups on health equity, women and family medicine, e-health, aging and health, complexities, mental health, palliative care, adolescent and young adults, as well as the environment. Before I hand it over to the convener of this webinar, I would like to say that unfortunately, this is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of our family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available, work collaboratively with your teams, do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contributions in facing the world crisis. No one knows what will be ahead of us in the weeks, but everybody knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Donald, for your welcome remarks and your immense support and guidance in this webinar. Now, I would like to invite Professor Ilka Kunamo for his speak on telehealth in COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, thank you, Prasad. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, uh, I already had a presentation. I'm working as a GP for 35 years as part-time, in addition to my other activities. May I have the next slide, please? So, I will present some applications which are COVID-19 specific and which are in heavy use in Finland. And the one is a national symptom checker which uh, actually should be and uh, also primarily is the first channel for people to contact if they suspect uh, COVID-19 infection. And then we have this national contact tracing app, uh, which uh, is a similar type of app that many other countries have. And it also communicates with a symptom checker so that if you get a message from the app that you may have uh, had a contact with the COVID-19 virus, so then you can fill in the symptom checker. May I have the next slide? So in Finland, we already have existing e-health services like symptom checkers, which were launched in 2018 in collaboration with Digi Finland, with a state-owned e-health company, with the Finnish Medical Society of Duodism Publishing Company, which I work for. And therefore, there is already infrastructure when the government, the Ministry of Health, asked uh, on March 10, just at the beginning of the epidemic, that a national symptom checker should be developed. And it took only six days when we were able to launch the COVID-19 symptom checker. Uh, there was a comprehensive news coverage on media and official websites when it was launched. And that was the same day when the national lockdown was ordered by the Finnish government. So the symptom checker contains interactive questionnaires in Finnish, Swedish and English. There is a rules engine interpreting the answer, providing advice what to do, triggering professional consultation, either electronically or uh, by telephone, or booking the consultation automatically. It also determined the urgency of the consultation. Or if the patient had just mild symptoms, they could uh, appoint, they could uh, book an appointment for the COVID test automatically. And the symptom checker is a medical device, according to the European Union Medical Device Directive. And about 1.3 million people have used the app already. Next slide. And uh, we managed to launch the app at the very start of the epidemic, just two weeks after the first cases in Finland, and one week after the number of cases had exceeded 100. And you can see that there was a very heavy use from the very beginning, then a plateau uh, after the first month when the epidemic was also 
already a little bit uh, quieter and then uh, nowadays there is more use again. Next slide. And this is an interesting statistics from some places in Europe where uh, the number of calls to 112 emergency, uh, that is the 991 in, uh, in Europe, and Finland was the country with, uh, with a significant decrease in emergency calls during the time of the pandemic, which is uh, in contrast, uh, contrast with uh, most other European countries. And probably the availability of the symptom checker is one cause for this. So during the pandemic, actually, it has been easier for people to contact 119 than at other times. Next slide, please. Then we have the national contact tracing app. Uh, we needed to pass a legislation which allowed the use of such an app. And it's based on the Google and Apple technology on which all the other similar apps, which there are many globally, are also based on. And uh, we were able to launch the app on September 1st, just at the second wave of the epidemic. And uh, the app is uh, very safe it uh, communicates with the national server by exchanging just random numbers generated by the app and no other information that could be used for identifying or locating the person who is using this. And the source code, code is open so that everything can get the source code and check how it works. And already 40% of the Finnish population have downloaded the app. And here I think Finland is holding a first place together with Ireland in Europe in the use of such an app. Next slide, please. And this is how the app works. It first uh, uh, checks the duration of contact, the duration of time when another app user has been close to the uh, person. Uh, here's an example. Bob and Mary sit at neighboring tables in a cafe and Mary is tested positive two days later and she informs her app. She feeds a code that she receives from the health service provider to enter into the app and at that point uh, Mary's app uh, triggers a warning that through this national server goes to all the other people who have been or whose mobile phones have been close to Mary's phone at that time. And uh, the second uh, uh, factor is the distance between Mary and Bob and uh, that is uh, determined by the attenuation of the Bluetooth signal. And the third factor is the time from symptom start or positive test and that is the time which Mary enters in her app when he has been, she has been tested positive. And uh, for all these three factors there are points and the total points are calculated and if the threshold is exceeded, so then in this case, Bob gets an alert that uh, he has been exposed to the virus. Next slide. And um, so, but what happens to those people who have chronic conditions and whose appointments have been cancelled during the epidemic? How can we make sure that nobody is neglected? Here is an e-health tool which I use in my practice. All my population data is available from the electronic health record. And for instance, here is data from my patients with diabetes. And uh, I can see which patients have the highest cardiovascular risk or which patients have the highest blood pressure. So I can pick directly from the graph those people who have highest risk. Next slide. And um, so I can get a list of people with the highest cardiovascular risk or who have not been an appointment with diabetes for a long time. And I get a list of pseudonymized IDs at the beginning. And then if I feed in this pseudonymized ID to my electronic health record, then I learn to know who that person is and I can open the patient's file. So this means that those who would benefit most will be cared for first and care gaps can be identified in the whole population and nobody with a chronic condition 
is neglected even during the epidemic. Next slide. So um, here is some international news about the use of e-health. There have been 10 to 1000 fold increase in the use of some telehealth application. From Rich Roberts, I got some interesting uh, statistics from the USA before COVID. Uh, up to 10% of consultations were via telemedicine. During the peak epidemic, about 80% about and now more than 30%. And the estimated projection is that 20 to 25% of the encounters will be electronic even after the epidemic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ilka. Now I would like to invite Professor Nick Gulliman for his talk entitled Artificial Intelligent Application and its Benefits in the Pandemic. Yes, thank you very much. And good morning here from the Caribbean. Um, yes, my daily business is transformation of healthcare systems and redesign of, of services working in, uh, in Leiden, as well as affiliation in um, Chechenov in Moscow, the medical university. And thank you very much, Ika, for this uh, nice uh, um, presentation. So next slide, please. So as, as what Ika also ex, um, um, showed, uh, this, this uptake of digital solution is, um, is, is there in, in healthcare, um, uh, as in other sectors, as what you see on the, on the left-hand side, uh, due to COVID. Um, uh, but if you really look more closely, it's it's mainly um, uh, in the communication application. Uh, so in, an alternative to communicate with uh, between professionals, uh, between professionals and, and the patients, the people. So that's that's really a good thing. Had uh, it really uh, increased the uptake of of digital communication in healthcare. If you look more closely to uh, AI smart solutions, automated solutions in healthcare uh, based on uh, artificial intelligence principles and algorithms um, and, and see how they are approved in, in various uh, systems. Uh, for example, this uh, is, is quite limited. So if you look into a recent paper published in Nature Digital Medicine, uh, you see only 29 uh, artificial based artificial intelligence-based solutions are approved and about 27 of them are mainly focusing on diagnostics, mainly radiology and you can understand because yeah this sort of artificial intelligence is based on data, there's a lot of data available in, in radiology and genomics etc uh, and not so much on uh, let's say the, the daily practice of, of work from clinician and especially in healthcare. So uh, it's, it shows a little bit a different picture from only communication if you look uh, to, to smart use of, of data in clinical practice. It's still quite limited. Um, next slide please. Um, so besides had uh, this more diagnostic specific, often hospital related inf um, applications, you see that these techniques which are used in artificial intelligence, machine learning, pattern recognition, mathematical techniques to aggregate data and extract um, uh, knowledge from them, is in the current crisis very helpful to aggregate this data and show insights on, on patterns, on developments. Um, so this is an example of uh, the Dutch dashboard. Uh, which shows an insight on uh, the, the current situation at the country level or even at regional level, making smart use of data and try to make them insightful for audiences, clinicians, normal people. So this is another powerful um, um, benefit from, uh, from these techniques. And obviously, uh, they rely on, uh, on, on data. And, and the quality and accessibility of data is really key in the sort of uh, development of artificial intelligence in, in medicine. And since uh, the, all these uh, data sets in healthcare 
if you're looking from an hospital, research, primary care, social care perspective, a lot of this data is still fragmented. It's isolated, it's siloed. So you really cannot capitalize on, on the aggregation and, and the meaning in a broader context of different data sets. Um, so these dashboards what you see in, in different countries is a little step ahead in trying to collect different sources of data and make them for the use of understanding on what's the current situation. So that's another, I think, good development. Um, next slide, please. But also, how this technology comes with concerns. Uh, so you see in the media also that has some statements like oh, computers, robots are better than doctors. Um, and uh, also about all kind of sort of risk modeling based on uh, genomics or, or data, uh, which people provide to commercial uh, parties. Uh, and even in genomics, uh, there's a, a sort of discussion on what is actually the clinical value of these applications and, and what is really the, the accuracy and the reliability. There are also ethical issues. So uh, in artificial intelligence, it's what's not so much is discussed is, is the limitations. Uh, it's just uh, mathematics and mathematics also and statistics, as you probably know, do have their limitation in what they can do. Uh, so that's, that's something to take in account. I won't go into detail, but also bioinformatics and genomics, where we have the most data available. And we spent uh, over 20 years a lot of work on um, working on predictive prognostic models. It's still very limited. So all this hype about that this bring the big change in healthcare, well, it's 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 mostly a hype, and it's really based on reality. The the, the promises in that respect is still, uh, yeah, quite uh, I say uh, limited. It's it's a form of automation. Next slide, please. So the implication is that. Uh, we have a lot of developments also in the area of e-health uh, and, and we have some of these smart solutions, uh, but usually they are standalone. Uh, they are not similar to uh, what we need in collaboration, integration and providing personalized medicine through a team of clinicians uh, from a hospital, primary care or social care perspective and across all these uh, um, sectors. And so we're still at the very early stage of integrating and making smart use of data. Next slide, please. So uh, although uh, we see over the last year some service platform which have the potential to, um, to combine uh, uh, the different professionals in the process of care, uh, which is also quite interesting, this development. It can really um, connect the different um, professionals. Uh, it provides um, a platform for communication, also at the patient side, the patient community. So these platform-based digital platforms have the potential to support also uh, primary care and family practice in, in working smarter and connecting people and, and professionals but, and also people. So that's, that's quite interesting to follow. And next slide, please. And recently, Wonka uh, performed a uh, project together with the Ping An Good Doctor in China, uh, which is uh, a digital platform based on, um, uh, uh, partly based on artificial intelligence. So on the left top side, you have an AI part. Uh, which uh, use with an AI chatbot. So the, the chatbot asks questions to the patients about the problems. And it's, it separates out, it filters out uh, uh, and focus on, on what the key issue is. So the AI helps in the preparation uh, in the connection with the online doctor, because that's a second stage in the platform uh, by which the online doctor receive the information partly prepared by the 
um, uh, artificial intelligence and give also some decision support to the online doctor. But the online doctor is still in control. He can ignore the sort of recommendations from the digital platform and combine it with his own clinical expertise. And what we found is also that um, this huge platform, and this platform has more than 300 um, million people uh, users on an annual basis, had that it increased compared to the China situation with the youth of healthcare um, with 200%. Um, and also had a cost reduction involved. So the, the early results from these type of platforms are quite interesting. Though we're still in the process of looking more at the clinical value and the outcomes of uh, these platforms. But you can say that, that here with solutions like interaction with the patient in the, with this artificial intelligence based chatbot, decision support, and also uh, monitoring, it provides the potential to, to make our work uh, more efficient. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's really interesting to look at, but also here the sort of uh, evidence and, and uh, validity and, and use in clinical practice in, uh, in outcomes is still to be proved. And I think if you look to the satisfaction rate, it's often very high. You see it also in Babylon Health, which is used in the UK. But um, because of the complexity of um, actions and the sort of... Um, yeah, research on the, 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 the meaningful outcomes from a patient and more um, clinical um, quality is quite complex. You see there's no, not yet much evidence uh, available from these platforms. So that is definitely something we can look at. So this was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Nick. Now I would like to invite Dr. Liliana Larenzo. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm uh, a GP. Um, um, I have a background as a GP. I worked as a GP for a while. And now I'm a research fellow full time in the University of Sydney. And most of my research is in digital health. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, a subset of our research, which is focusing on chatbots and particularly whether they can be helpful in this fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So uh, around two years ago, we began um, seeing the use of chatbots in, um, for health-related purposes. So chatbots or conversational agents are systems that mimic human conversations, whether using text or spoken language. And because we were seeing this uptake, um, not only in daily life uh, to check the weather, but also for health related purposes, we decided to do this systematic review and actually um, evaluate how they were being used for, for in healthcare and for health related purposes. And so we found that um, at the time, there weren't a lot of studies, experimental studies on this, uh, but, what we found was that most of the existing experimental studies were evaluating chatbots to support patients um, with self-care tasks. And one of the most common um, health domains was mental health. And so that's the example that I have here. Um, this is Wobot. And so one of the studies included in our systematic review was a randomized control trial evaluating this um, cute little um, chatbot named Wobot. So Wobot is freely available um, via Facebook Messenger, so a commonly used platform. Um, it was developed in Stanford and it has attracted lots of funding. And in this um, randomized controlled trial, they actually found that Wobot was able to reduce symptoms of depression. Um, statistically significant, obviously. So uh, that was an interesting finding. And it was one of the most robust studies in the systematic review, actually, um, because since it was two years ago, the field was still a bit uh, ripe in terms of experimental studies. 
Next slide, please. And so we uh, thought that it would be interesting, given the commercially available chatbots, um, to test them and ask them health questions and see how they would respond. And so you can see in this um, figure here on the top, um, the, the themes of the questions that we asked, um, they range from mental health related ones to more lifestyle based, uh, diet, exercise, smoking. And on the left, uh, the first column, you can see the chatbots that we actually tested. And so the green uh, that you see are appropriate responses and the red are inappropriate. Um, so it doesn't look great, right? Um, obviously, we, we ask the questions um, uh, the way we would normally talk. So uh, it wasn't like the chatbots were purposefully um, developed to answer these questions, but still we were quite surprised, for example, one of the questions that we had was, how do I eat less fast food? And the answer from one of the chatbots was giving directions for the nearest uh, McDonald's. So um, that, was, that was interesting. And, and so that brings the problem of um, when we have uh, these chatbots that accept um, any type of language, they sometimes only uh, catch a few keywords and then give a standard answer. And that can be problematic in health, as we can see. Next slide. Nevertheless, um, because they have so much potential and they can, can be programmed to give um, specific answers to a, a certain topic like COVID-19, uh, we thought that they could play a role in this pandemic. And so in March, we started writing this paper and we were basically trying to figure out how chatbots would eventually be used during the pandemic. At the time, um, there was no uh, chatbots around there. Um, and what we thought was, given their um, capabilities, they can help with disseminating information, combating misinformation, uh, which turned out to be a big problem during the pandemic. Um, they can help with symptom monitoring as well. They can provide behavior change support and mental health support. For example, Wobot um, can be used for that purpose. And so that's what we uh, set out in this paper. And one of the things that we said was it would be good if governments collaborated with existing companies to rapidly develop these chatbots. And so we were very surprised when uh, a few uh, weeks later, some governments started, and now lots of governments have their own uh, chatbot. And they actually um, collaborated with tech companies. So they, they used WhatsApp, for example, which is Facebook, um, to, to build the, the chatbot, the Australian chatbot, for example, is based on WhatsApp. And what they currently do is mostly provide um, information. For example, where are the latest outbreaks? Um, what are the latest restrictions and rules? Because it's always changing, um, things like that. But we, we see untapped potential here. And so it will be interesting to see what happens um, in the next few months in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liliana. Now I would like to invite Professor Richard Osborn for his talk, Digital Health Literacy, Digital Divide and Misinformation. Next slide. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, next slide. Yes, there's a lot of information out there and uh, health literacy is an area of tremendous interest. So people are getting immense amount of information. Next slide. What we find, and uh, next, uh, what we're finding is that there's so much good and bad information out there. It's coming so quickly and it's coming through in a way which 
the average person can't tell which is correct and which is not correct. This creates a tremendous problem. So in many ways, health literacy is uh, potentially our most important weapon against COVID. We need people to understand what are safe behaviours, what information to follow, what to not to follow. In my, I've been working with WHO for uh, many years in providing support and thinking about health literacy and providing developing toolkits. And what WHO really did do beautifully was actually to put out an immense amount of correct information. Immense, thick and fast, thick and fast, and developed really important collaborations with many of the major uh, IT companies and uh, digital companies to have when people did a search they went to the reliable source really 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 critical so we ha have to have a consistent information coming in from all levels of government all levels of uh, the healthcare system to support people to make accurate and good decisions next slide so what is a health literacy approach well health literacy has five key areas in which people need skills or capabilities and that's been access, accessing and understanding and appraising and retrieving or remembering and using health information, health services. So we use this approach to help develop uh, interventions that are equitable, that are use, useful by the anyone really, the lowest common denominator. So health literacy approaches where we ask questions like, what patterns of health literacy strengths do people have? Especially those who are not, we're not being effective with or we're not reaching. So we have to take a, a strengths-based approach. The person can't read, we need to look for other things. And then the second point, what strategies are available for us to work with people with low health literacy, including the critical role of community conversations? which certainly can start from a conversation that a person has with their clinician. The next point, how can we implement strategies for people with the lowest health literacy in their community or with people with special health literacy needs? Migrants and refugees, people with disabilities, people who are actually sick and they're not taking things in too well, people with mental health conditions. Then how can we assist health professionals to use careful and sensitive assessments to use different strategies based on people's needs. So indeed, we need to understand people's needs, their different strengths, to be actually able to tailor and strengthen the repertoire of health professionals to make sure that everyone has the best chance of understanding the teach back concept, making sure that a person understands what you're saying. You know, asking them, I just need to check to see if I'm doing my job right. Can you tell me what you're going to do when you go home after sharing your pearls of wisdom? after sharing uh, the instructions of how to take their medicine or how to, what health behavior they need to undertake. And that's the teach back concept. So the purpose of health literacy is to improve the health and reduce health inequality. And that's the core uh, topic of this presentation. Next slide. So when we think about our five areas of health literacy, there are very particular ways in which people learn and next, slide. So for a lot of people, um, the internet isn't so good to help them with accessing because they don't have access to it. They might not better understand and read very well um, and not better appraise information in that very well at all. And but it may help them remember and retrieve things. It may help them apply things. But talking with health staff is critically important generally for many, many people, but it may not help people remember or actually help apply because it may be too technical. Next slide. And printed materials and media can be very mixed for some people too. Next slide. And community conversations are a critical thing which happens basically everywhere. The conversations that people are having their family, across their community, and we have to get the right conversations happening across different peer groups in different parts of the community. And then many parts of the world is actually arts and songs in, in communities where there isn't a written tradition, but there is a narrative tradition um, in their linguistic structures. Next slide. Yep, I've emphasized that one. Next slide. 
So in thinking about really trying to understand, I guess, the potential of the di digital divide, we built a health literacy questionnaire, which has been used in 30 languages in uh, hundreds of studies around the world, but we really thought we need to develop a digital health literacy questionnaire. So with the team in Copenhagen University, we spent many years really understanding from the patient's perspective, what do they really need to, be able to use digital technologies? And then we also work with clinicians and digital experts. What really works to get people to understand and use digital health in many settings? So there was a grounded approach. We went in there without any particular theoretical, and we really, really listened to the community. So this questionnaire has been translated to a wide range of languages across Europe and increasingly um, in Africa and Asia. Next slide. So the framework that we built from the lived experience of ordinary people that you see every day. Next slide. So three key elements is ability to process information. The second one is people's engagement in their own health. The third one, ability to actually engage with digital services. So you can imagine if people don't have these really basic user capability skills, it's gonna be very tricky for them to engage in the nice shiny technologies that we build. Then we're finding that trust and motivation are incredibly important. If people don't trust, they could have all the skills in the world, but if they don't trust it, they're not gonna go anywhere near these shiny technologies for fear of their data being used. And of course, as we know, the media is very good at finding the one in a million or one in 10 million event, making it feel, appear very common and making it feel like a huge risk to the whole of society and actually ruining an entire five or 10 years of research and very moral behavior. You have to be very, very careful. But of course, and it's very rare that we do have data breaches. The last one is the experiences of digital services. So people's access to digital services actually work consistently, sensibly, so that they feel it's worthwhile going back again. And the digital services actually suit individual needs. So we're working trying to understand these elements of people from the actual capabilities, their trust and motivation, and their experiences. They're very, very strong determinants of people actually engaging. So imagine if you built some technology with all these things in mind, that you built it from the first principles of what people really wanted and could do and would do. And you built into your technology the key elements that would overcome people's challenges or barriers. So the, indeed, this is exactly what we've been working towards, which we have built, is a way of actually doing co-design, building up people's strengths and weaknesses, because in fact, Every patient that comes in has a different set of strengths and weaknesses. You don't treat all patients the same because the average patient doesn't exist. So we actually find that there's very, very different patterns of all these. So we work with these dimensions, we build clinical vignettes, and we have these superb little stories of people in the community. And then we go to people in the community, ask them, hey, you see this person, Joanne, for example and Joanne has this mix of strengths and weaknesses as described here from the data analysis data that's collected from the actual clinical communities. And then people in the community and the clinicians and experts tell us, oh, this is how we solve the problem to so this particular combination of strengths and weaknesses. So we get actually hundreds and hundreds of ideas from people. And this is something that we call Ophelia, optimizing health literacy and access, which has been implemented in uh, about 10 countries in Europe and increasingly in other countries and many settings in Australia. So this is a setting where we really want to make sure that it's fit for purpose because we've got these wonderful technologies and these technologies are often very good for the people they're good for. Ah, it sounds like a tautology. A lot of the technologies, we do experiments on the technologies, we implement them and one group they find that's useful. So it's useful for the people it's useful for, but what about those people who don't even engage in designing the services, don't even, can't even, you can't even recruit them to your studies? How big is that group? We are really finding that there are a substantial number of uh, people in community. Uh, Mikesh Harkerwell is one of our close colleagues here in Melbourne, 
is well known to some groups in uh, the GP world. We're finding even in high tech clinics, there are people who have no interest, no capability of engaging technology. They are completely left behind. So we have got to start thinking about building our technologies so it really reaches into people's hearts and minds in their communities and people support, support it to engage. You can't even get an appointment. You can't even get to see a GP unless you've got some sort of engagement technology. So many people being left behind. Next slide. So we have done a piece of work for the um, very large national agency to understand people's engagement in um, a digital health record. And when we saw this graph here, now this is the EHLQ scales categorized from the highest health literacy to the lowest health literacy. And this graph is so uh, clear that if you have low skills on health, e digital health literacy, you will not engage. A lot of it's to do with trust, a lot of it's to do with access, but this is just a slide to remind me to say, we really have to put into our equations when we're building these technologies, and implementing them, that we understand people's capabilities and needs, all the different variations, and ensure our technologies are supportive to get people to participate, enable people to participate. Next slide, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Richard. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Raman Kumar for his talk on telemedicine practice in low resource setting using basic IT tools. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parman. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to talk from my own experience as a private family physician or GP on outskirts of New Delhi, India. And India, as you all know, is a large country. We have 1.3 billion population, 28 states, and nine union territories. And all these states and union territories have their own respective uh, health policies and regulations. And uh, government at national level, as well as state levels, they are uh, providing provisions also using digital technologies. For example, we have our national uh, mobile application uh, for patient tracker. And we also have uh, national helpline numbers, state helpline numbers, where patients and people can directly call and get help and advice. What I'm going to talk is from my own uh, private practice perspective, but it's not representative of all India or what we do uh, across India. So I'm based in outskirts of Delhi. I'm a solo practitioner. I, uh, I charge my patients directly. I do not get any reimbursement from public or private insurance. And the committee I serve is mostly young and educated young means you know, mostly the, most of them are in their 20s and 30s. So telemedicine was not legal in India till recently, only during the lockdown, the last week of March, it was uh, regularized by the Medical Council of India. And there are uh, clear telemedicine guidelines now available uh, for practitioners and we try to follow them. And already there were several mobile applications available in the market. I've shown few of them on this slide, M Fine Practo, DocSap. But when it came to my own practice, I was doing a regular uh, you know, traditional GP practice. Uh, I decided not to use them for three reasons. One was cost because you have to buy their subscription. Second was the data issue because all your patient data goes to their you know, common uh, digital platform. And uh, uh, third was how do you, uh, you know, it was like a marketplace where you compete with other providers and you, you know, it's a mixing of patient communities and it was not very comfortable situation for uh, family physicians. And this is about my experience of around 700 unique consultations and these are not repeat consultations. Next slide, please. But basically, I am using. Uh, I decided to use uh, primary consideration was mobile phone because this is where everything converges and everybody has a mobile number. And similarly, uh, WhatsApp is another technology and uh, commonly used application. Why most of the you know uh, even uh, remote areas they have mobile number, WhatsApp, and smartphones. And I had to have a payment uh, gateway which was uh, used digitally, which is also linked to my mobile phone. I use G suit, uh, G seat, uh, because uh, this is almost similar to what we uh, normally use in our Google Gmail application, but it is additionally, it has to have a domain name and it provides you additional services. So a general flow of consultation would be like 
I'll get appointments from Yellow Pages or uh, Business uh, Identity at Google Search. And then the registration is done through Google Form, which is uh, archived at Google Sheets. And then the diagnostic reports and data exchange takes place on WhatsApp Business. So WhatsApp, as we know, is of two types. One is, uh, uh, you know, is a general and other the business which has additional facilities of uh, labeling your, you know, uh, uh, your chats, your talks, your uh, contacts, and it is more. It, it can also display your brochure or your name or your business card. And then there is a payment uh, part, which is also again integrated to by mobile phone itself. I still write my prescriptions on paper and scan them with Adobe because it gives a personal touch, and that paper is archived on uh, uh, Google Sheet uh, Drive. And from there we get follow-up. I also use a IVR service, interactive wire service, which is a small subscription price for archiving all telephonic talks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Now I would like to invite Professor Meme Tungan for his speak on experience on IT-based difficulties we faced with and how we solve as a long lesson. Sorry, yes. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the word, giving the word to me, Mr. President. And uh, dear colleagues, I have been uh, uh, watching the presentations and uh, learning a lot. And I think uh, at the end, we will have a very fruitful discussion. So this is actually the, uh, not exact experience on IT-based difficulties, but what we have learned and what we have faced. And then uh, the summary of the uh, those items which we had. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, just we have two networks in Europe. Uh, probably you are much aware of them, and Europe, the education, and Europa is the rural doctors network, and they had a pandemic survey on telemedicine, especially, and also digital care. So I would just like you uh, to know that, you know, it, is, um, it was a few months ago, so it might not be well, but it's still giving us kind of idea in our practices. Approximately 80% of the uh, GPs in Europe have video consultation in their, their practice, which is incredibly high numbers. So 33.4 uh, of them uh, among the 33 countries reported presence of a telephone triage service for the COVID patients during this pandemic. And almost 65% were using retired uh, general practitioners in phone triage, and mostly they were um, the retired ones. And so approximately 75% of them had no remote consultation guideline which caused a lot of small troubles in, in between, which I will tell you later. 65% approximately of the family doctor rated satisfaction more than three among five, you know, a Likert scale type of the questionnaire. So you can tell that 15% of them were extremely satisfied, but uh, you know, just it's more than half that most of them were satisfied with this kind of applications. 90% of the patients rated uh, more than half of the, you know, um, the scale, it's three over five. So, and when you look at the extremely satisfied, it's approximately the same with the doctors, with the physicians. And 40% of the family doctors face with IT problems during the consultations, which is an important amount. And I have seen in the slides, in the previous slides that, that the uh, internet patients. So what are the key messages in pandemic, including also the digital care and the telemedicine in family medicine in, in Europe? So I can tell you that the family doctors across Europe played an essential role also with the digital and also telemedicine technologies, in, even in Europe. And the clinical practice in family medicine uh, was rapid, successful implementation of the telemedicine and digital care and remote care model was depending on this, uh, actually contributing a lot in this success. And what else, the other, the other items which are now facing with the universities and the medical schools, medical education and research in family medicine, 
yeah, it is challenged by the pandemic, opening new IT platforms and perspectives in these areas also. And those are in our daily lives. And risk of misdiagnosis appears to be greater in the telemedicine, while the legal statutory clauses are not universal. So this is actually one of the most important items that we have been facing with in the practice. Uh, digital care and telemedicine has the potential to break down the inequalities, which is nice. The, and also should not be used as a tool to cut services. This is very important for us and our uh, Europa, the Rural Medicine Network, emphasized the importance of it uh, several times, that it should not be used as a tool to cut the services. And there is a, uh, there is a need, a regulation activity in, in both uh, digital care and also the telemedicine and need minimizing the bureaucracy, hindering development and implementation of formal and informal uh, digital care and telemedicine. I think uh, what we can just uh, mention here progress only when the of ecology become for everyone. This presentation, not to ignore or not to uh, cut uh, those kind of services which are already used by the public like WhatsApp, telemed, uh, Telegram or just the other technologies you have been uh, using already in your daily life. Please. Can I change it? Okay. So what are the key messages for a, in a pandemic? Those are the, the, on the left side, you can see the positive sides and on the right side negative messages we could just give to, to you. Most of you knows the positive sides that we have been experiencing already but also we have some uh, problems. It might hinder a good doctor-patient relationship which is at the heart of our profession as family doctors. We have to be very careful examination sometimes used to limit or cut the primary health care services which is we are totally against for that requires resources and effective infrastructure and robust the investments to be feasible and effective so uh, the, on the right side you see that this is the uh, non uh, as a non-state actor in the who seventh regional meeting our network, Euro, uh, Euro, uh, Europa and Wonka Europe, and together with the other non-state actors, we made a statement. If you read it, it will be summarizing and emphasizing the importance of the digital services, including the telemedicine, but also warning the governments uh, to support the systems in a proper way with the proper infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my last slide. And what I, what I ask? you know we in practice we have to be very careful about the consent for online consultations this is mostly automated but i think it is better to be careful because then the uh, consequences may appear later and the documentation of like the documentation of the type of consultation medical service per, uh, performed and date time duration and location of the patient and the physician like physical locations. And also the most important thing is ID confirmation. In some parts of the Europe, uh, the people can consult uh, for their you know, um, relatives, but at the end, it might have a consequence for you also. And so uh, the telemedicine uh, and also digital care may expand the primary healthcare team because we have been always looking forward to expand the primary healthcare team. So uh, in delivering the public health services, I think this is another tool for us that we can include other uh, team members into that. New working styles and roles we have experienced already. And uh, there should be an interdisciplinary approach in this area, which I see there is already, but that should be also emphasized the importance of interdisciplinary approach, which is different than the uh, multidisciplinary, actually. 
non-registered professions might be on the same digital platform for the non-communicable disease patients. And there should be a need for support and guidance like an orchestra playing in a concert to function as an integrated team. And need trust, a clear understanding of those. A coordination is re needed for sure. And what the most important, and the last word I should say to you is that all those technologies shall include the family doctors into all decisions and development in the initial stage on digital healthcare and telemedicine. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Professor Mehmet. Now we will be having our panel discussion on predicting digital health after the pandemic. And I will request Professor Richard Roberts and Dr. Anna Luisa Nevis to take on the floor for this panel discussion. Hello, everyone. Next slide, please. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a family doctor in Alpine, Texas. That's in West Texas. As they like to say, there's a lot of space out there. The next closest community with a hospital of any size is about 300 kilometers away, and that's a medical school university hospital. And your town has 6,000 people, four family doctors, and a 25-bed hospital. It's January, and you're in the middle of a very unusual and severe blizzard, much snow and ice and wind and you decide to stay at the hospital because you're responsible after hours that day. And about 11 p.m. at night, Maria comes into the emergency department and she's complaining of several days of fever and right upper abdominal pain. <clears throat> As you begin to evaluate her, you find on physical exam that she has a fluctuance or an area of fullness and swelling in the right upper abdomen. She has an elevated white blood cell count. She has elevated liver enzymes and you decide to do an ultrasound in the emergency department, that shows what looks to be an enlarged gallbladder. So you assume she has cholecystitis, though you're concerned as well about an infection. You consult with the surgeon at the university hospital, 300 kilometers away, and she asks you to put on a piezoelectric glove that has a tactile sensor that allows her to feel what you're feeling as you palpate Maria's abdomen. And as the two of you are looking at the same ultrasound image, the surgeon says, well, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in terms of the cause. It could be a stone, it could be a cancer, but at the very least, she needs to have that gallbladder emptied. And the problem is the state highways are all closed because of the roads and the helicopters are not flying because of icing conditions and visibility. And so you take her back to the small operating room that you have in your rural hospital and she guides you through placing percutaneously a red rubber catheter to effectively create a cholecystostomy and decompress the gallbladder. You start the patient on antibiotics, and by the next morning, the roads are improved, and she's able to be transported to, uh, to uh, Odessa, Texas, where Texas Tech Medical School is. During her days in the hospital, she develops a pulmonary embolus, she has right heart failure, and each day you check in with her and the surgical team at the bedside using video conferencing to give them a sense of who Maria is, this delightful 72 year old abuela or grandmother who's very technology resistant. It took her grandchildren years to get her a mobile phone which she finally agreed to start to use. Um, and as you follow her course of illness, you're pleased to see she eventually improves and goes back home. But because of her other medical problems, you try to improve the level of monitoring that she receives. So she's wearing a watch at home that gives regular readouts of her pulse and her oxygen levels, pulse oximetry and blood pressure. And this feeds directly into your electronic health record and your clinical decision support tool will pop up when the average reading for her pulse oximetry is below 88% saturation when her blood pressure goes below 100 systolic or above 160 systolic, and her heart rate goes below 60 or above 100. And what you find as these days go by in her post-operative recovery is that she's beginning to engage with you electronically much more than she ever would have before as you exchange information back and forth, indeed using video consultation in her home. And what you find as you collect all this information is that this tools, set of tools, 
really helps to extend your reach and allows you to do things as a family doctor that you may never have had the, the, uh, the ability or the courage to try. Uh, that is the future. And if we go to the next slide, as we think about digital health, we uh, realize that there are a number of ways that this will play out. What we've talked about for the most part this morning is using it as a communication tool, and indeed that's where most of the work has, has gone, but there are a whole array of activities. I, with Maria's case, I mentioned biosensors and wearables. Those are becoming increasingly affordable and easy, and you, you can buy one right now that uh, does a lot of this data collection for you. Uh, telemedicine are doing consultations, data analytics, using behavior modification tools, as we heard nicely from Liliana, using medical social media. So one of the things that Maria did was got involved with a d group of other f people with diabetes in her community, and they have a chat where they swap uh, recipes and things like that. Her digitized health record allowed you and the surgeon to be looking exactly at the same information because your platforms were shared across this large region. Uh, it's an entry point for patients and doctors to talk. We use artificial intelligence to help uh, tell us or guide us on what to do and using telehealth or teleradiology as a technique to improve our imaging capabilities. But each of these uh, activities has not only uh, exciting possibilities, but also uh, great concerns as we get into them more and more. So, if, for example, with the biosensors, you know, just in terms of the regulation of these devices, their accuracy, their reliability, there's still much we don't know. Um, when you talk about telemedicine, it's difficult enough with a patient right in front of you where you can talk th to them, watch their body language, reach over and touch them. To do that, a step removed by way of a computer is even more difficult. And one of the things that's been interesting about uh, the pandemic and the increased use of telemedicine is rather than substituting for consultations, what we're finding in the US that it's actually increasing number of in-person consultations by about 20 to 25%. In other words, the fantasy that many people that pay for healthcare have is that telemedicine will actually substitute for doctor visits. It turns out to be just the opposite as we collect more information. It seems to generate more use and potentially overuse. Uh, when you look at things like uh, artificial intelligence and analytical tools, um, we've had a very uh, checkered experience with that in the United States. So for example, the IBM Watson supercomputer, the, the, the company entered into an agreement with the oncology community in, in the US to use Watson as an important clinical decision support tool. And they did this for three years and finally decided they had to stop doing it because Watson got it wrong way too often. Now, some of that's the limits of artificial intelligence as it stands today, but some of it as a person who's expert in evidence is that frankly, the underlying scientific evidence sucks. That's what most people in the public don't understand. A lot of what we do in making judgments as physicians is take very vague symptoms, uh, somewhat fuzzy physical findings, and we lay that against a backdrop of really crappy science and somehow make a judgment, which thankfully most of the time turns out to be pretty good. Um, and so the concerns as you look ahead is the possibility of over overutilization of, of people promising, policymakers and others promising more than the technologies will deliver, but there's no question that it's coming. And the last slide for me shows that when you look at how quickly humans take up new technologies, it's not only that we're taking up more new technologies all the time, it's that we're taking them up much more quickly. So for example, if you look at the telephone, starting way back in 1900, the red dotted line, it took about 100 years almost to have nearly 100% of the world's population with access to a, a telephone. But if you look at mobile phones, it took about 10 years. And so we're this phenomenon of technology not only exploding in terms of different kinds of tools, but the rate of uptake, it, or uptake is really almost overwhelming. And so I think the challenge for us as family doctors will be how to sort through all of this stuff and figure out which tools or technologies will be most useful to us and most importantly, most useful to our patients. And let me turn it to Anna for her remarks. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, and I think it's actually a very good way to finish uh, when we talk about uptake to understand what kind of uptake it is, which patients do actually engage with the technology, and whether we are actually creating more opportunities or entrenching inequalities that are already there. 
So most of our, my work at the Patient Safety Translational Center is about use of digital technologies and how we use them to partner with patients, we engage them in the process and to deliver a safer and equitable care. So if I can see the next slide, please. So one of the things, uh, one of the things that we have been quite concerned, uh, as uh, Richard just put very well, is that there's a huge potential on the use of digital technologies in the different aspects. We're talking about telemedicine and remote care, but all the other aspects of it, of course. And one of the things that's really concerning is that we know that in what, when we talk about technology, the take is not the same. So it's not the same for a younger person and the older person. It's not the same for people with different digital backgrounds, as uh, Robert Osborne already mentioned as well. And it's not the same for people with different socioeconomic backgrounds, ethnicity, etc. So we need to be really aware of these. And although we might uh, want to push these as much as possible and try to make the most of digital, we need to take into account that not all patients are going to take this in the same way. So one of the things that we're really keen uh, recently was to evaluate how was the experience for general practitioners and for patients uh, in a range of different countries. So what I'm going to present very, very briefly are the preliminary results of an international survey. Um, some of you are involved in this, some of the panelists. So we are covering 16 countries and we have 1,500 responses for uh, all over the world. And we ask GPs, so how was the experience? How did this impact the patient care? So if you can see the next slide, please. So one of the most interesting things and uh, most concerning, I would say, is when we ask uh, GPs, so what was the impact of remote care of telemedicine? And this covers video consultations, phone consultations, or online services. Uh, what was the impact on patient care? As you can see in the, in the columns on your left side, there was a very positive uh, change in what uh, positive impact in what concerns managing COVID patients, preventive care, all kind of care that we are we, we usually provide through face-to-face -face, uh, monitoring diabetes, hypertensive patients. Obviously, these are the kind of situations in which uh, remote care and telemedicine works really well. But if you look in the left side, um, you can see not in the last group of columns, but the one before, you can see that for most of the doctors, there was actually a negative impact on equity of care. So this is something that we uh, could anticipate somehow because of what is already known as digital divide, but it's something that we know it did happen during the COVID pandemic. So how do we move from this? How do we move forward? How can we learn from this experience? If I can have the next slide, please, Harris. Thank you. Um, so the next step, as it was already discussed here, and this is just a way of actually trying to structure the discussion and start posing the questions to the audience, is try to understand what can we learn and how do we move forward. So we know that face-to-face -face is not for everyone. Uh, and we need to understand for which patients does it work, in which circumstances, and how can we make it uh, answer their needs. So one of the key things I would say as researchers and the primary care physicians is for us to understand for which patients and for which conditions does digital works. And of course, as part of this work, we need to understand the groups of patients that were actually excluded from the process during the COVID pandemic. And this is something, as we have already discussed as well, we know that the trend will continue. The adoption is likely to remain, not at such a higher levels that will remain somehow and we need to understand who was left out of the process and which were the reasons for patients to be left out because it can be something as easy as um, preference some patients might not want to engage it but it might be actually much deeper than that some patients might not be aware of it so even here in the UK uh, although there was a quite strong campaign about telemedicine there was a recent survey showing that 20% of patients in Northwest London they were not even aware that they could contact their doctor remotely so there's a a work for us to do as physicians and of course this is not something that we can or should do alone this is a work of a group of key stakeholders including physicians patients policymakers we need to work together to make sure that patients are aware of what's available if they don't have the digital skills if they don't have the overall skills to engage it we need to be able to provide these kind of opportunities for them and obviously to support them through the process in case they are willing to join in the digital transformation and I think overall, this is kind of strategy that we have been discussing. And I think this could be something interesting to leave for the audience as well, Richard. What do you think? Definitely. So would you like to ask the first question of our other panel members, Anna? Yes, definitely. So one of the, so we have prepared three questions. Uh, we've been discussing what would the key message for the audience. And the first one would be, what do you think is the key thing that family doctors need to know about the use of digital technologies for the future post-pandemic? 
And as we go through this, uh, it would be great to open it up to all 30 some people that are online, but that will uh, keep us here for about a week. So we're gonna ask just the panel members to speak up on that question. And I'll depend on Harris to keep us on time with whatever time we have remaining. So perhaps uh, we could start, and I'm just looking at my screen with the, the various people's pictures. Uh, and I'll just start from the left to right. Uh, Ramon, what would you say about that? What would be your answer to Anna's question? Uh, I think uh, the new new generation of uh, family physicians are more uh, aware of the technologies as compared to or more adaptive also and the new new generation of the population also is you know more adaptive to the technology as you mentioned in your slide so one is you know the situation is rapidly evolving it is not you know what it was even three months back and it is you know like you know chatbots uh, whatsapp chats and all these are evolving very rapidly even the regulations are evolving one is to be synced with the what is evolving and be informed with the regulations laws technology devices is most important uh, for at least for the provider's perspective that we are aware of the things what we can best facilitate or optimize thanks uh, ilka would you be kind enough to share your reflections on this okay thank you very important questions uh, i think of course for every gp it is important to learn about the tools and start using some of those tools as now has largely happened during the COVID pandemic. This has been a very good opportunity to learn the tools when there has been a must. But I think also you should uh, collaborate in addressing uh, uh, public health administrators and uh, leaders, the government, that they would provide the tools, they would finance the tools that would be available for every patient, uh, for every GP, because you cannot just invite the tool yourself. You must have something that is provided equitably to everyone in the population. Thank you. Uh, perhaps we could move on to Raquel and ask you for your comments. Yes, I would like to underline Ilka comments because it's, uh, it's so important to have a multidisciplinary approach because if government is not supporting the initiatives, we don't have anything to do, was, was the case, for example, in Luxembourg. We're discussing different applications and at the end the government was not agree. So yes, we have to work um, having the whole picture in mind, not only our uh, position. Yes, thank you. And uh, Harris has given me uh, a signal that we have about seven or eight minutes remaining, uh, just so we can be mindful of the time. Um, Mamet, your experience as a family doctor, how, how are you keeping up in this area? How are you uh, staying on top of the latest technologies and deciding which ones to use or encourage your patients to use? Uh, that, that's very hard question but i think it's our task uh, to not to foresee the future but to enable it so that's the reason i think those are the people uh, in the front line who would uh, start to use such kind of technologies on behalf of the public health as i mentioned uh, we have been all already aware that you know it's it is a necessity so in during a uh, lockdown periods and such kind of periods if if you have those patients in chronic conditions trying to reach you and if you can't go there so this is a real problem so we start to use and we didn't care whether this uh, this was legally or um, without regulations uh, it might cause a lot of problems and we don't know whether it is reimbursed or not or it will be reimbursed or not and finally we have seen that it, none of those uh, consultations are reimbursed by the governments in most part of the year, actually, which is a big problem. Uh, but on the other hand, we are just taking all the problems out and we are trying to serve to our patients as GPs and our family doctors, actually. So we are using. Uh, what we started to use, we prefer to use those technologies which are already being used by most of the population uh, like the you know phone the, the those smartphones smartphone applications i can just say here the whatsapp uh, you know tele what was that telegram or such kind of you know social things and or sometimes on skype also so we we tried but we couldn't reach them like 
uh, like we do here in you know, a Zoom technology or such kind of thing, of course. But still, we found it very effective in most of the cases because, you know, uh, the uh, I don't like to use art of family medicine, art of general practice. I don't think that it's an art. It's kind of the, uh, learning. But it is generally said that, you know, it is an art. Okay, if we accept it, yeah, at the core of that, when you see the patient from your door coming inside of your consultation room, you know, the first image is approximately 80, 90 percent of the, you know, diagnosis. You go with that. OK, so after that, you have the questions and the answers and then you build it in your mind. So most of them can be done you know, on the screen with your patient. Of course, the satisfaction rates are not which we would like to see, but it is still fine and it's still helpful for the chronic diseases. Uh, Rich, I don't know uh, what to say more, but I think we, we are obliged to use it, whatever our age, you know. Well, if I might ask Richard Osborne to unmute his uh, microphone. Um, I think one of the challenges, and Anna spoke to this, was how to make sure that uh, patients have equitable access to these technologies. And uh, Richard talked about health literacy. For me, literacy really has two parts. The first is uh, the ability to communicate. And so for somebody that may be blind, deaf, or mute, uh, there are literacy challenges just being able to uh, communicate. And, and in, in an analogous way, it's the same when you don't have other tools that support the desire to communicate electronically. And then the second is uh, helping people understand how to use the tools and so on. So Richard, if you could advise family doctors, the family doctors of the world, on one thing that should be done to improve uh, health literacy through the use of technologies like digital health, what would you say? Well, thank you for 30 seconds for a very big question. I think the, the most important will be to continuously demand of the technology builders to meet the needs of your full range of patients. So uh, your full, you have patients with immense range of capabilities and you need technology that is as easy to use as possible. And the technologists need to build community-based education programs that can go in libraries, that families can use together, and that this, it needs to, the technology needs to be built with outreach technology uh, or training for the community as well. You can't just build a standalone kit or app. It's got to be all that implementation needs to be thought through as well. So demand that you can't just have standalone. It's got to be think of the, your entire practice and community you're caring for. Excellent response. Thank you. Uh, and if I could ask Liliana, you know, I'm amazed in the United States during the pandemic how low the trust is in the entire healthcare system. Uh, the estimates are that 50% will not be interested in a COVID vaccine when it becomes available. Um, and so the problem, I think, is not so much uh, inability to communicate. We may be, we may be communicating uh, too much and too easily via Facebook and Twitter and the like. Um, and, and so one of the things that interests me as you were talking about mental health uh, is there is this dichotomy that patients seem more willing many times to discuss sensitive issues electronically than they are face to face. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so that's a very interesting um, aspect. Um, the, the misinformation um, epidemic that we're all observing uh, nowadays is, has been fueled mostly by social media. And there are several studies now that show that uh, fake news spreads much more rapidly uh, than um, <laughs> facts. And so we have to be um, think about strategies about uh, how to disseminate um, correct information. And I think using social media and other, other platforms, um, uh, such as chatbots on WhatsApp, uh, is a good idea to try and combat that. Because um, we know that just by denying misinformation, that's not a good strategy at all. We have to remain with the facts and just reinforce the facts. And there's evidence showing that um, when we talk about a specific uh, type of misinformation, for example, um, anti-vaxxers, we're giving them a platform and, and that is counterproductive. So there's still lots of research going on in 
in this uh, area, but it's, I think social media has a role to play there. Excellent, thank you. And I'll uh, ask, um, uh, I guess Nick, you haven't had a chance to respond. So I'll give, give you a, a one minute question before we turn it to Raquel to close us up for us. So, so Nick, um, as you look at this with a fairly global perspective, working in multiple countries, uh, how good a job are we doing in developing policy that is uh, coherent and effective? Uh, and if it's not very uh, effective and coherent, what would you recommend that we do differently as both uh, at the national and international or global levels? I don't know if Nick is still with us. It looks like he is. Maybe you need to unmute Nick. Yes. I oh, there we are. I, I was worried you headed to the, I was worried you went to the beach. <laughs> no, no, no. It's quite a few meters. Anyway, so no, I think from a Wonka perspective, this is quite powerful because it's, it's very practice oriented. And for this, and I think also Mehmet mentioned this, we need guidelines. We need a clear overview. Okay, what are the tools? Uh, what is their use and, and, and possible risk and, and benefits? So that's one. If you're talking more from a systems perspective, I think uh, in general, health systems don't do a good thing in integrating things for the functional need of professionals as well as people. Uh, so this is quite complex also uh, what you can learn from this um, seminar. It has so many angles come to it, so it really needs also an integrated approach on, on make the real benefit of technology in healthcare and, and make it work. And I should say that in general, the, the best evidence for improving efficiency is on support with this collaboration and making information understandable, use them in daily practice with the people. Um, and there's so much we can, we uh, should still do because everybody has its different angles, governments, WHO, industry, et cetera, the different disciplines. So I think um, considering the primary care is really the key issue for sustainability in healthcare systems, almost with any healthcare system. So I think as, as Wonka, as family doctors, we should make a stronger voice in this and, and point towards the importance to better collaboration, uh, better integration of these technologies in, in daily practice. And I think this is what, what we, we can do together. I find it exciting and comforting that we have so many uh, smart folks uh, helping guide us on this. So thank you for all the panelists. Let me turn it to Raquel to help finish out the session. Thank you so much for, for your presentation and for participating in this webinar. I'm really sorry that we don't have more time to answer the questions that our participants were sending to the panelists, but I, I will transmit it to the, to the e health group and that will be um, properly answered. I don't have so much time also to make remarks, but I think in the, the helplines of this discussion have been that is, uh, we need more research um, we need much more evidence, not only on the satisfaction of the use of the technologies, but also how this um, is uh, impacting in our daily practice and in our patients. It's necessary to have education for, for the population, for the professionals, for the uh, medical students, and also for the stakeholders and all others uh, involved in the, in the healthcare system. We have to learn from what has been done until now in the pandemic and how we'll use it in the future. It's very important that we analyze what we have done and it's obvious it's challenging for everybody, but this has forced us to use the um, e-health technologies, the digital solution, and this opening a window of opportunities because we have been very keen uh, fighting for e-health in, in the last years and we face some resistance from other colleagues. So I think we all realize the importance of digital health and it was uh, an opportunity to raise awareness on the use of it. We have learned from different um, solutions on so different research from our colleagues, very interesting one. And I think the words of mix to, to uh, wrap up the webinar have been very wise. We need better collaboration and inter interprofessional um, uh, collaboration to make this happen. So I would like to close it. Thank you, Dr. Prasar, for um, the convener of the eHealth uh, working group to bring this webinar. 
to all the panelists and a speaker for the valuable contribution. I think we need much more room for discuss on he health. Is this has been just a uh, a muse bush, just a start of the discussion, but we need much more space and time to discuss longer. I want to thank Wonka to lead the floor for this important matter and support digital health and all the participants that have been there. Um, if you want to be more engaged on the um, e-health working party, here you have the details to, to be part of us and continue the discussion online and on the future. And for the next uh, webinar, I would like to invite you in the 11th of October at the same time, 10 a.m. UTC, for the special interest group on aging and health that will also open a very important discussion on this COVID-19 times. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. And goodbye. <laughs>